Repo market, what are the unintended consequences? This is a follow-up on yesterday's video, and I'm gonna explain this to you in three simple, fast steps. Oh, time out. If you hear the hammering outside, it's some construction workers, but we're gonna power right through this video. And in fact, one of the construction workers looked like Janet Yellen. So I think the Fed sent her down to try to stop us from doing this video, but we're not gonna let Janet's hammering stop us. So let's dive right back in. Step number one is rates plus quantitative easing equals collateral. As we know, the financial institutions and hedge funds take that collateral, they put it into the repo market, that's where they get that cash. So the amount of collateral, good collateral, is equivalent to the amount of cash that's actually available in the system. If we pull up that chart from yesterday's video, we see that since 2008, if the Fed has expanded their balance sheet, interest rates on the 10-year or the real economy have actually gone up. This takes us over to the collateral issue that we have. The two main forms of collateral in the repo market are treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. You can see that this mortgage-backed security is just toxic sludge. It's actually almost dripping off my whiteboard. But these treasuries and mortgage-backed securities are valued based on the yield. Therefore, if interest rates go up, the value of the treasury or the mortgage-backed security, in other words, collateral, actually goes down. So if this treasury is worth $1,000 at 2%, it may be worth only $500 at 4%. Keep in mind, these are not exact numbers. I'm just using them as the example. This is just like your house. And if you wanted to use your house as collateral on a loan and your house was $100,000, you would get a lot more money for that loan than if your house was valued at $50,000. And as we all know, that could be predicated upon interest rates, meaning the lower the interest rates are, theoretically, the higher your home price will go. So we've got this little equation that the amount of collateral is equal to the amount of money. And the amount of money and collateral in the system is equal to the interest rates. Therefore, if interest rates go up, the amount of collateral available or the value of that collateral goes down. Therefore, so does the amount of cash that's available. So rates go up, collateral goes down, cash goes down. If cash goes down, the Fed prints money, injects it into the repo market. This is to compensate for a lack of collateral or a lack of cash. But let's just shelf that for a moment. Go back to quantitative easing. This is where the Fed goes into the bond market to buy treasuries. It takes those treasuries from the bond market, puts them onto its balance sheet. But what are treasuries? Treasuries are collateral. Collateral for the repo market. So by the Fed doing quantitative easing, they're reducing the amount of collateral available for the repo market, which makes the Fed have to inject more money because if there's less collateral, there is less cash. Because the repo intervention and quantitative easing is expanding the size of the Fed's balance sheet, or BS, if you will, and it's basically money printing, this has the tendency to make rates rise if history is any indication. Going back to that chart that shows that when the Fed has expanded their balance sheet, interest rates on the 10-year or the real economy have actually gone up. So you can conclude by the Fed actually going into the repo market because there's too little collateral, this in and of itself is creating less collateral. And quantitative easing is twice as bad because this theoretically is making rates go up because of money printing. And it's literally taking collateral out of the system in the form of taking treasuries from the bond market and putting it onto its balance sheet. Basically what's happening is the Fed is creating less collateral by trying to fix a problem of less collateral. And if this sounds like the snake eating its tail, you're right on the money. That takes us over to my DVW, or Doom Vortex Waterfall. This starts with the Fed increasing its BS. 
That makes rates go up and they do quantitative easing. That's less collateral because rates are going up, less collateral because of quantitative easing. This forces the Fed to print more money to go into the repo market and bail them out. Well, this of course creates more BS by the Fed, which makes interest rates go up, which makes less collateral, which takes them right back to printing more money to go back into the repo market. The main point with step number one is the Fed is gonna to have to set up a permanent repo facility and they're gonna to have to completely take over the entire repo market. Step number two, we go into the unintended consequences of the Fed being the repo market. This is a chart of the repo rate from August 13th of last year to September 16th of last year, 2019. As we know, the interest rate or the repo rate spiked September 17th up to 10%. Well, what is this? This is a price signal for the market. And you may say, well, boy, if the Fed is the repo market, we'd never have to worry about these repo rates spiking in the future. And you would be correct, but we also wouldn't receive that price signal, which gives us so much information that we need. Number one, the repo market needs more cash. Okay, we got that. Or it needs better collateral. Or there's someone in the repo market that we shouldn't be lending money to. And on that quick note, I wanna throw in a bonus explanation. When the repo rate spiked to 10%, why did the Fed have to come in rushing to solve this emergency situation? Why was that? Well, the Fed funds rate is the rate that banks lend to each other overnight. All those big banks that are under the Fed's umbrella. This is how the Fed sets the Fed funds rate. So if the Fed funds rate is 1.5% and all these banks see the repo rate spike up to 10%, they're gonna take all their money out of this market and put it in to that market. That means the Fed funds rate is gonna go through the moon and the Fed is gonna lose control of the only rate that they should have total control of. That means the market freaks out and collapses. This is one of the main reasons the Fed had to bail out the repo market. But getting back to the unintended consequences, taking away this price signal is the same as a bank trying to determine if they should or shouldn't give a loan to someone without having their credit score or an insurance company having to decide whether to give someone car insurance without having their accident history or taking it to a personal level. It's like getting married to someone and not knowing they were in a mental institution. Whoops, don't wanna do that one. Or it's like going down to your local doctor and having them try to assess you without knowing what your blood pressure is. The bottom line is this price signal is crucial to the market. And if the Fed is the repo market, then we lose that price signal altogether. But that's not where it ends. Another unintended consequence is the banks won't be allowed to fail. They can take any type of garbage collateral that they have, go to the Fed, and the Fed will just give them however much money they need to stay in business. This creates a very weak type of sick economy versus a very strong, robust, and dynamic economy. The economy is just a very complex system of billions of transactions going on per day with thousands, millions of variables. But I can't explain this near as well as Milton Friedman. Editor, let's cut to the clip. This is a private enterprise system. It's often described as a profit system, but that's a misleading label. It's a profit and loss system. And the loss part is even more important than the profit because it's what gets rid of badly managed, poorly operated companies. If he isn't bailed out, will the effect be that Chrysler will disappear? Not at all. Most bankrupt companies come back into operation with a new management and a clean sl financial slate and are more efficient. The fact that Chrysler goes bankrupt doesn't mean that his factories are gonna go up in smoke. 
If they're worth using, they'll be bought by other people to be used. Like GM. And in fact, you'll have a strong... They might be. Doesn't GM that bother you? As compared with what? as compared to have the government own the factory and produce it. And we haven't even talked about moral hazard yet. If the Fed is the indiscriminate lender in the repo market, the big banks are gonna see this and take advantage of it. And why shouldn't they? They know the Fed is backstopping the repo market, the stock market, the corporate bond market, the housing and mortgage market. So they're gonna continue to grow in size. This is gonna increase the size of the financial economy. And the bigger the financial economy gets, the greater dependence the real economy has on that financial economy. It creates a game of chicken where the banks can almost force the Fed and the government to bail them out at any time because they're so systemically important to the real economy. This starts with moral hazard. And if you don't think the banks will take advantage of the Fed owning the repo market, let's go to a story of Lehman Brothers in 2008. Lehman had posted as collateral at JP Morgan over the summer of 2008 a security called Fenway, which Lehman claimed had a value of $3 billion. JP Morgan concluded the security was quote unquote worth practically nothing just days before Lehman went under, prompting the big bank to demand more collateral from Lehman Brothers. According to the report, Lehman was also able to use the repo market in other ways to artificially lower its leverage at the end of the quarter, keeping as much as $50 billion in assets off its balance sheet using what it dubbed Repo 105 transactions. So what are Repo 105 transactions? According to Investopedia, it was a type of loophole in accounting for repo transactions that the now extinguished Lehman Brothers exploited in an attempt to hide true amounts of leverage during its time of trouble in 2007 and 2008. So it's safe to conclude that these big banks are constantly rigging the system with all of this financial engineering that benefits them, but is a detriment to everyone else, including the real economy. And number two, we can conclude that if it wasn't for the market forces, if the Fed would have been in charge of the repo market back in 2008, groups that should have gone bust, like Lehman Brothers, would still be in business today. This creates another doom vortex waterfall where the financial economy gets bigger. That means banks are getting bigger. The greater dependence the real economy has on the financial economy, that increases the likelihood the big banks will be bailed out. They know this, so they take on more risk, which increases the size of the financial economy. Step number three, we go from moral hazard to terrifyingly dangerous moral hazard. It is now officially stiff drink time. And to explain this, we're gonna to go to an article from professor economist Richard Werner, who is an international banking expert. Fact, how Barclays Bank invented its own capital. And this was to bail themselves out in 2008. Step number one. September 2008, Barclays Bank needs 5.8 billion pounds in new capital. It plans to issue preference shares. It finds an investor, the state of Qatar. But Qatar is fully invested and does not want to liquidate other assets as markets have collapsed. I think that was a nice way of Qatar just telling them they didn't want their garbage equity. Step number two. Problem solved. Barclays lends $5.8 billion to Qatar. Contract signed. Step number three. Barclays now owes the borrower 5.8 billion pounds. This is the amount of the loan. Step number four. Barclays now pretends it has discharged its accounts payable liability by recording it as a customer deposit. 
but neither the bank nor the customer nor anyone else has made such a deposit. And he's making it more confusing here than it really is. I'll explain in simple terms in a moment. Step number five, Qatar now draws down its deposits with Barclays in order to purchase the newly issued preference shares. A liability swap, problem solved. Barclays reports an increase in its capital of 5.8 billion, a case for the serious fraud office. Let me explain this to you in simple and fast terms. It's actually pretty easy. Barclays goes to the Qatar Sovereign Wealth Fund and says, listen guys, we are in some deep doo-doo right now. You know that GFC thing? Well, it really, really sucks and we're almost insolvent. So we need a little bit of a favor. We're gonna create these shares out of thin air and we would love it if you could pay us 5.8 billion pounds for those shares. And Sheik Pete, who is our politically incorrect sovereign wealth fund manager, again, we don't care about that, on this channel says, hell no, I'm not taking your garbage equity for my good collateral. So Barclays says, okay, fine. Well, you've got an account with us. Why don't we do this? We'll just create the 5.8 billion out of thin air, like we know banks can do, especially banks in the UK because they don't have a reserve requirement. We'll deposit that into your account and then you can take that 5.8 billion that we just created out of thin air and use it, you can give it right back to us to buy those shares that we also just created out of thin air and magically we will be solvent. Problem solved. Sheik Pete looks at them and says, man, that is some shady business. But fine, whatever, I'll take it. I'll take those shares for free. Barclays bails themselves out while they're looking at Lehman Brothers saying, ha, those fools. They tried to bail themselves out in the repo market when all they would have had to have done is just print their own money and commit serious fraud. If the Federal Reserve takes over all of the financial markets, including the repo market, this is gonna happen in spades. This will exponentially increase the size of bubbles, exponentially increase the size of risk, and exponentially increase the size of the next collapse. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here and I will see you on the next video.